This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello and welcome to an Agenda Special. I'm Stephen Cohen. This week we're looking at the global search for that golden bullet, a vaccine to combat COVID-19. Scientists around the world are joining together. We'll be hearing from the Director General of the International Vaccines Institute. As human trials continue in China, the US and UK, we'll be asking how long it might be before we find a cure. And we'll be finding out if a successful vaccine is the only safe way out of global lockdown. The World Health Organization says the only way to fully interrupt the transmission of the coronavirus and lift lockdowns completely is the development of a safe and effective vaccine. But what is a vaccine? Well, it's a harmless version of a virus that trains your immune system to respond quickly if you are ever infected with the real thing. A vaccine containing weakened bacteria or protein mimicking a virus enters the body. Then, after several days, your body starts to produce antibodies to protect you. Then, these antibodies are specific for this virus and your body remembers them. Then, if you're exposed to the virus in future, your body is now primed to respond quickly. And the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations has identified more than 100 vaccines at various stages of development around the world, at least five of which have already started human trials in China, the United States, and here in the UK. But it may be months, possibly years, before the WHO's wish is fulfilled. The search for a vaccine began globally in early January, when China first shared the RNA sequence of the virus. By the end of the month, the virus was grown outside China for the first time, a crucial step in looking for a vaccine at the Dirty Institute in Melbourne, in Australia. That allowed scientists around the world to uncover the true characteristics of the virus, another crucial step, and to grow enough of it in a lab so experts have enough of it to work with. But even once a possible vaccine has been discovered, it then needs to be tested and passed by regulators before it can be distributed. But with unprecedented cooperation between experts and the fact that COVID-19 shares 80% of its characteristics with the SARS virus, which had been studied for nearly two decades, there is real hope a vaccine is within reach. What is less clear, though, is who will foot the estimated $2 billion bill to come up with that golden bullet, let alone how much a single dose might end up costing healthcare systems around the world. Joining me from Seoul to try and answer that and many other vaccine questions is Dr. Jerome Kim. Uh, and Dr. Kim is Director General of the International Vaccines Institute. Dr. Kim, thanks for joining us. Tell us a little more about how a vaccine is created. Right. I, I think the first thing to remember is that, you know, vaccines are, are based on a concept that we learned um, from the natural history of infectious diseases. And, and, and that is that, by and large, for most of the diseases that, um, that we've developed vaccines for, if you get the natural infection, if you get measles, or if you get mumps, or German measles, typically, for the rest of your life, once you recover, you'll be protected against that disease. So you're immune from reinfection. And really, a vaccine does exactly that. By taking a small part of a virus, or taking the virus itself and killing it with heat or, or uh, formaldehyde, um, a, a, a vaccine developer can inject it into um, a human and create the same kind of defensive responses that the body makes when it's normally attacked by measles or mumps. And in doing that, um, the body generates these responses that are normally designed to rid the body of the infection, but instead what those responses do is that they protect the individual against infection by the real virus or the real bacterium. It's not just about 
developing a vaccine, though, is it? It's all about distributing it to. Right. So, you know, vaccines are developed in phases, um, and there are typically three phases that take five to ten years. And the first phase, we, it's, a, it's usually conducted in about 50 people or less, and it really is, looks to see whether the vaccine causes any um, safety signals or, or is associated with any um, bad side effects. We also look to see if the vaccine is kind of making the right protective responses, but the real goal of the first phase is to make sure the vaccine is safe. The second phase, we actually begin to look at the vaccine in what we call the target population. That is, what group of people are we going to use the vaccine in uh, eventually when, when we finally have a vaccine that's licensed and, and ready for use in humans? Phase three, we actually look to see if the, the vaccine is safe and effective. Does the vaccine protect against infection or disease? And then, after all of that is done, and usually, again, that's five to ten years, you take that entire package of data, of information, and sometimes it's 100,000 pieces of paper, and you take it to the MHRA in the UK or the FDA in the United States and give them all of that and say, we believe that vaccine protects. And the regulatory agency will look through all those documents and say, yes, we agree with you, or no, we don't agree with you. Um, and if it's approved, then it goes to another group. Because you know, just because you have a vaccine that's ready for marketing doesn't mean that doctors around the world are going to prescribe it. So you actually have to have another group that tells you, yes, we agree this vaccine is ready, you should use it. This is, this is an incredibly long process, uh, how you've described it. Human trials have started I in the UK, but d is that significant? Does that mean we could have a vaccine sooner rather than later? Yes, so I, I think um, most people remember that in December of 2019, we knew absolutely nothing about this virus. And now in, in April, we actually have a number of clinical trials going on in humans. And for vaccine development, now remember a process that normally lasts five to 10 years, to get the first vaccines into humans and the first one went into, um, into humans in the United States in March of, 20, uh, of 2020. So three months after really the virus was described and sequenced, we actually were testing a vaccine in humans, and that is a remarkably short timeline. I mean, most people, when they describe this, use the word unprecedented. How quickly after the, that testing could it be applied to the general public? Ah, uh, another very <laughs> important question. So typically, when you're in the five to 10 year timeline, during the third phase, the final phase of testing, the company is usually building the manufacturing capacity. Because remember that in the end, a vaccine company is supposed to make money for its shareholders. So they don't want to have a, an approved vaccine sitting around waiting for the factory to be built. So typically they're building that capacity while the trial is still going on, hoping that the vaccine will succeed. This is a little different. So remember that we've compressed the timeline from five to 10 years to maybe 12 to 18 months if everything works well. So that means that the people who are funding uh, the vaccine developers in this case will also have to help probably um, with the development of the manufacturing capacity to, to get these vaccines into humans quickly. And so that will happen uh, probably while in, during the final stage of testing. They'll be looking at companies that could potentially make this vaccine for human use. And governments, of course, will be adding a lot of revenue. They will be paying for a lot of these tests because every government in the world wants to see a COVID-19 vaccine on the streets. Yes, every, every government does, but not all the governments have the means to do so. So, you know, maybe if you're the United States or China, you can put enough money into a company in order to get it to accelerate vaccine um, clinical development and then, you know, get the, the company to promise that when they have a vaccine, that you have the rights to the first, um, you know, so many millions of doses. The other countries in this world, um, you know, the UK is among them, uh, Norway, Germany, Japan, India, and others have joined an organization called CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. The Wellcome Trust and the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have also contributed to CEPI. And the, the idea behind CEPI is, you know, let's put together um, funding and collectively develop a vaccine so that for these outbreak diseases, which are very unpredictable, and, and of course COVID-19 is the perfect example of one, um, we can accelerate vaccine clinical development. So we no longer have to wait five to 10 years. Maybe we can do it faster. And when we all succeed, then potentially we can all benefit. But how do you 
make sure that all the scientists are working together. I know that WHO is coordinating uh, the efforts, but as you say, there is a scramble. There's a race in China, the UK, the US, to take three examples uh, to find this vaccine. Uh, how, how do you coordinate so much science, uh, which is so widely distributed? I think that having a, a core funder like um, like CEPI uh, will mean that there is a group of, of countries and scientists who are looking at all the products that are that are funded, uh, potentially can compare the defensive responses that are developed. And in the end, do they want to test all nine of the vaccines that they currently are paying for, or do they want to pick the top two or the top three and take only those forward? And when they do that, are they going to look at the vaccines that look the most promising or vaccines that are associated with big companies that can rapidly manufacture and scale up production? I mean, the, the choices that are that need to be made are ones uh, that have to be discussed. I mean, in a big company, if you were Merck or GSK uh, or you know, Johnson & Johnson, you, you might be able to do it all on your own. And, and typically, that's what the big companies do. But a lot of the groups that were chosen initially by CEPI and are faster are small biotech companies. The other part of this is that we all have to recognize that COVID-19 is, is a global pandemic. And until we can vaccinate enough people around the world and give more people the benefit of vaccination, then really it, the world will not be safe from COVID or the next pandemic virus. We have to work together in order to show that these vaccines work and then distribute the vaccine um, equitably with access to everyone. All right. Dr. Jerome Kim, uh, Director General of the International Vaccine Institute. Many thanks to you for joining us here on the agenda. Thank you. As we've heard, human trials of a number of vaccines have already started. But what does that involve? Well, we can cross now to Wuhan in China and join two participants of a vaccine trial uh, in that city, where the virus, of course, was first detected. Wu Xiaohun, who teaches English at Wuhan University, and her son, science student Lu Gongling. Welcome, uh, both of you, to the agenda. Let me start with uh, Wu Xiaohun. Why did you decide to volunteer for this vaccine? Well, actually, I've been following the news report about vaccine research from the very beginning of the coronavirus outbreak. And um, it's a great shock and a big surprise for me to know about so fast the vaccine research has moved into the clinical trials. And the first stage have been finished successfully. I guess every one of us would be very happy about the progress. So I have great confidence uh, in the medical research team. Uh, but, you know, here now, there are not so special cures and uh, effective treatment for this disease. If the vaccine could be success, it may be one of the most powerful weapons against the disease, and therefore many people's life would be sa saved. So from this point, I think to be a volunteer would mean a lot to me and to us. Lu Gonglin, uh, did your mother know that you were planning to join this trial? Uh, no, no, she didn't know. It, it, I happen to, we happen to know about the information needed volunteers uh, in the evening of April 9th. Then I was quite excited that I can do something for real. Uh, and my only concern is that whether my physical condition could be okay to match up those requirements. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to take a try. So I click in and fill in the basic information about myself and answered all the questions. Um, finally, I made it successfully. <laughs> After it, I sent the link of the application to him without saying anything. Uh, without asking whether he would be willing or not, I just to send it to him. So, Lu uh, Gangneng, your mother sent yeah. you the link and you decided yes. to volunteer. What happened after yes. that? Uh, I just, uh, I just uh, volunteered and, uh, and I didn't know she's, she's also, uh, she's also 
get into this uh, trial. And uh, my mother didn't tell me that. So I'm so uh, when I know when I knew she is also in this trial, I'm very shocked. Um, can I go back to Wu Xiaohun, go back to your mother? Um, did you find yourself uh, sort of a bit uncomfortable after taking the test? H how did you feel? What did it involve doing? Yeah, uh, I, I didn't feel anything different uh, or anything abnormal, uh, except that in the first evening when I received the injection, I felt a bit painful on the sport. Uh, and around the spot in my upper left arm, uh, a bit painful. But after two days, everything is fine. And I feel quite good now. And uh, the temperature is always uh, all right. So sometimes I even forgot the injection. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have to go back for more tests? Yeah. Yeah, we have to go back for... Uh, for maybe the further test about the blood. Uh, just uh, yesterday, we went there for the second time to draw the blood and then come back quickly. And, and how soon do you think you'll get any feedback, any results from the tests? Uh, yeah, they didn't tell us much more details, but I know it, it's, it's going to be lasting for six months long. And we have to go back there four times, totally. Um, so I think maybe in October, th that will be October, and we will know something about the vaccine. Uh, when you were talking to the people taking your tests, did they think, were they uh, thinking positively that they could perhaps come up with some kind of result, some kind of vaccine in six months' time? Um, we actually we don't know, <laughs> but I I think uh, I, I'm confident because those news reports about the vaccine research um, basically covers about the positive results. Uh, I'm not a medical science major, uh, so I do not know much about it, and we'll just wait and say. Of course not. Well, you teach English, which is evident by your excellent English. Wu Xiaohun and Lu thank Gongling, you. thank you both very much for joining us on the agenda. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Still to come here on the agenda, we'll be asking if blood plasma could be the key to a cure for COVID-19. On the agenda with me, Stephen Cole, we look up into space. We look down into data. We look at debt. We look at politics. We look at opioids, climate change. We look at all the issues that really matter around the world. But you matter too. We want to tell the stories you want to see and hear about. Make it your agenda. In the absence of a vaccine, the main weapon in the fight against coronavirus so far has been social distancing, along with attempts by scientists around the world to improve treatment for those suffering from the virus. Here with me now are Stephen Kistler, research fellow uh, at the Harvard School of Public Health, and Evan Block, associate professor of pathology at John Hopkins School of Medicine. Uh, Stephen, first, your research suggests that social distancing uh, on its own is likely to be insufficient to fight uh, COVID-19, doesn't it? Hi, yes, thanks for having me. And you're exactly right. Um, it seems that social distancing will allow us to prevent cases from overwhelming our critical care capacities within hospitals. But if we do stay on top of that and we don't have a treatment or we don't have a vaccine, that becomes available, um, we'll have to be at that for a very long time before enough immunity builds up in the population for us to actually emerge from this pandemic. Could you have too much so social distancing? Would that be a bad thing? Well, from an epidemiological standpoint, I suppose not. Um, 
if we're only paying attention to this particular illness. But of course, uh, social distancing comes along with all sorts of other costs that are social and economic. Um, and you know, we've also heard reports of people who might be holding back from um, going to the hospital for other conditions, other severe conditions that they might have for fear of contracting COVID. Now, that might not be actually a, a social distancing-based phenomenon, but nevertheless, it's very clear that, uh, that social distancing can have lots of negative knock-on effects that we really need to be aware of. Uh, Evan Block, your research has been looking at the potential of COVID-19 plasma transfusions. Sure. Now, um, that's a therapy technique that hasn't been used in the United States anyway for, for some considerable time. Can you tell us how it works? Sure. So it's, it's actually been used for, for over a century in, in different settings, both in the, in the context of, uh, of post-exposure prophylaxis as, as, as well as for treatment for, for diverse um, infectious diseases. So, you know, the premise is fairly simple. What's happening is, you know, un unlike vaccination, where one's really provoking um, an active immune response with, uh, with, with convalescent plasma, what, what, what one's doing is one's collecting plasma from someone who, is, who has recovered from the infection, develops antibodies, and then one transfers those, those antibodies passively, either through infusion or transfusion, um, into someone who has been exposed and is at risk of, of COVID-19 or um, who has active, active disease. Uh, Evan, though, is this feasible for the treatment of large numbers of people, um, and treatment so on a global scale? So, so absolutely. So, you know, one, one of the advantages of, of convalescent plasma is that it's, it's readily scalable because one can uh, leverage existing, uh, pre-existing blood transfusion infrastructure or collection infrastructure, both in, in high income countries where most of the focus is in, at the moment, but also in, in, in low middle income countries where one can, can similarly do this through, through whole blood collections. Are plasma transfusions a long-term solution or are, are they temporary? So that, that's a great question. I, I would see this really as a, as a temporizing measure uh, pending availability of, of, of more defined strategies such as you know, vaccine development uh, or hyperimmune globulin. Unfortunately, if one looks at the timeline to developments of those, one's, one's looking at months to in the, in the context of vaccines, potentially years, um, you, know, uh, you know, pending availability. Uh, Stephen uh, Kistler, that w one person has suggested that this uh, vaccine or a vaccine could be some way off, but uh, also the COVID-19 could become something like a flu pandemic uh, and keep coming back. Uh, is that likely? Yeah, you know, I think there's reason to believe that it could. Um, we know quite a bit about other coronaviruses that have circulated in the past. Um, there are a couple of coronaviruses that uh, that do circulate every winter and are much like a flu-like illness. Um, and then there is also the SARS example from 2003. And we know that immunity to those coronaviruses isn't permanent. Uh, for the seasonal coronaviruses that we see every year, it usually only lasts for about a year and maybe a little bit longer. Um, for SARS, it can be a little bit longer, but it doesn't seem to go much past five years in most cases. So as long as that immunity declines over time, I think that um, you know, as long as SARS-CoV-2, the one that we're facing right now, um, follows in sort of the same pattern as these other ones, which I think we can probably expect, um, until we do have a vaccine um, that, that provides longer lasting immunity potentially, then yes, I think, I think that we um, are very likely going to see wintertime outbreaks of this virus as well, um, either annually or maybe every couple of years. So in the absence, Stephen, uh, of a vaccine, uh, is there still the argument then for uh, the herd immunity? Well, there is to some extent. Um, you know, if, if that immunity lasts long enough, then there is a scenario in which we could drive the number of cases of this illness low enough through herd immunity um, that then we could shift strategy and either, either eliminate the virus, um, similar to what we did with SARS, um, or, or at least have it at low enough levels that other interventions like contact tracing um, become feasible again. Um, but of course, you know, at, at this point, what we need is as many different interventions and treatments um, as, as possible, because every little bit helps here. Evan Block, that there's still an awful lot we don't know about COVID-19. Um, is it dangerous to start clinical trials uh, as they've started to do in China, US and UK when we know so little? 
Um, I think that there's sufficient data, you know, just looking at the, the convalescent plasma um, part of this, I think that there's sufficient data where uh, convalescent plasma has been used in, in China and in Italy uh, and and um, through an expanded access program in, in the US. There's probably been over a thousand uh, transfusions to date. It seems to be, just looking at the, the safety signal, it seems to be relatively well tolerated, which is consistent, you know, historically when it has been used. It has been well tolerated. I can't say whether it's effective. Um, and if, if one looks at the trials which are which are about to get underway, uh, it's targeting you know the whole spectrum of disease from uh, from post exposure prophylaxis through early you know early disease you know outpatients, moderate disease, critically ill, um, as well as the pediatric population, although you know comparatively less at at, at risk. And so through those trials, I think, you know, to answer your question, firstly, I, I think that there, there really are sufficient human data um, to support um, at least evaluation. I, you know, I can't speak to whether whether it will be effective. You know, obviously, that, that, is, that is definitely the, the, the hope. But, but yes, I, I do think that it is, it is ready for, for evaluation. Stephen Kistler, how, how effective would you consider antibody tests in the fight against COVID-19? So antibody tests are reliable for certain cases. Um, so I think what we will be using antibody tests mostly for in the near future is to determine how much immunity there is in a given community. For a given, for a particular person, there's there's enough error in the tests at the moment that it's it's very it, it can be difficult to get you know an absolute foolproof proof um, determination of whether or not a person either has been infected and even beyond that is immune to reinfection. Um, measuring immunity through an antibody test is a complexity that's even above and beyond uh, just measuring whether or not a person has been exposed and infected with a virus. So I think that antibody tests will be increasingly important as the epidemic continues to get a sense of how much immunity there is in the population, and that will give us a sense of how much risk there is um, to relaxing social distancing and potentially how much need there is um, to allocate resources such as treatments and, um, and hospital resources uh, in case there might be a flare-up of infections um, if there is very low immunity in a given population. So real urgency about that testing. Uh, Stephen Kistler and Evan Block, thank you both very much for joining us here on this Agenda Special. Sure. Thank you. Thanks very much. This is the long haul. The chief medical officer has warned Britain to get ready for what he called another year of disruptive social distancing measures. Professor Chris Whitty said the UK's lockdown wouldn't come to a quick end. And that applies to much of Europe as well. We don't know when the current lockdown restrictions will start to lift in the UK. What we do know is it's going to be very difficult for life to return to any kind of normality until a vaccine is found. And there's been a scramble to find one. The good news is human trials have already started and are being coordinated by the World Health Organization. UK Health Secretary Matt Hancock said he was throwing everything at the country's efforts to create a COVID-19 vaccine. Researchers are confident they'll have one ready within 18 months. If so, that would be the fastest humans have ever gone from seeing a brand new pathogen to developing a vaccine against it. But Sir Patrick Vallance, the chief scientific advisor in Britain, is dampening expectations, saying only some end up successful. This will take time. A vaccine would normally take years, if not decades, to develop. Researchers want to achieve the same amount of work in only a few months. And it's important to add that, as Sir Patrick reminds us, all vaccines are a long shot. Coming up on a future agenda, we'll be putting your questions about the battle against coronavirus to the World Health Organization's Margaret Harris as we ask the agenda. And if you have a question for the WHO, you can tweet us at CGTN Europe. And if you want to send us a question on video, please do so, letting us know your name and where you're from. Simply use the hashtag AskTheAgenda. Don't forget, for more content, you can visit our website or you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. But for now, from me, Stephen Cole, and all the Agenda team here in London, it's goodbye.